Hey, welcome to the Short Story Ears. And today it's all about the CMOs. We have Pat McDonald here, the Chief Strategy Officer at Dancer Creative. Hi, Pat. Hi. And the topic is quite exciting. Me being the former CMO myself, I'm just keen to learn more about the thing that we do on a regular basis, which is this white paper that is called the CMO Report, the latest issue of the CMO Report. Uh, when was that published? Quite a few weeks ago, right? Yeah, I think about three weeks ago now. Okay, so fresh, still okay yeah. to talk about that one. Right? <laughs> um, so first question, quite easy. What is a CMO report and why should people be quite excited about it? The short story is that CMO report studies 700 CMOs around the globe and it asks them what they're excited about, what they're anxious about, what's changing and how they think about marketing, agencies and brands. So it's a great opportunity for agencies to keep track of what their clients are thinking about and for clients to see how they're benchmarking versus their peers in terms of how they're thinking about marketing, the technologies that they're investing in, are they tracking against their peer group or are they maybe pursuing a different strategy? So you are sort of studying the industry by talking to the CMOs. Right. Two questions here. Why the CMOs? Why not a combination of CMO plus a CEO, CTO, CPO, I mean, any given letter of the alphabet, right? <laughs> because to me, the CMO would be probably one of the most integrated jobs in the world. You can't really deliver unless you're talking to your people in sales, to your business strategist, to your CEO, and so on and so forth. And the second question would be, okay, you're talking to CMOs on a regular basis. Super cool. Do you see that the role of a CMO is evolving itself? And if it's evolving, then how exactly? So we definitely see the role of the CMO evolving really quickly. So overwhelmingly, they say that their job is becoming much more complex. And we can see in the study findings that they are having to think about everything from brand to experience to content to commerce in a way that they just weren't having to five years ago. So their role is becoming much more expansive, much more complicated to navigate and what they really want from agencies is to not talk to them anymore about how complicated everything is but to focus on making things as simple as we possibly can and really helping them navigate that complexity collaborate brilliantly bring exactly the right group of people around the table so their role is, is absolutely changing and i think you put your finger on it really what why talk to cmos um i think one that they're one of our most important stakeholder groups so they absolutely are, are key to the density relationship um but also they have got that real breadth of understanding and breadth of uh obligations across the the, the uh, networks so they are not only thinking about comms or media they're thinking about commerce they're thinking about product they're thinking about distribution so of course uh we have other stakeholders who are incredibly important be that um that the cxo the cto um all of those people are, are really vital for us but cmos probably have the broadest perspective across the business at the moment which is brilliant for them but also really challenging um, speaking about the findings in the report, 87% of course said that AI, generative AI represents the future of advertising and marketing. And I think we did really well here because, you know, we had two first questions, non-AI related, but question number three, of course, it's about AI. You, you can't really escape that. Yeah. So how do you think the role of, uh, CMOs will change with the rise of AI? I think one of the things that's created this, this huge complexity for CMOs in recent years is just the sheer volume of assets that they need to create across different channels, different formats, different geographies. They've really had to wrestle with how they balance that global consistency and local flexibility, how they create really relevant, effective comms in market while still driving all the efficiency that you want from a global brand. So I think generative AI has huge potential to solve for that, to create really brand safe, brand consistent models for really fast iteration and adaptation. So when you take away some of the logistical challenges of the CMO role, that real headache of I need hundreds of different adaptations for hundreds of different markets and formats and all of the complexity that creates, I think that frees them up to think about some of the more profound and existential challenges 
that are facing their businesses. And as that cost per asset comes down, I think they'll have really interesting opportunities to create highly personalized experiences and to really invest in innovation. So I think it's going to have a fantastic impact in that respect. 87%, that's quite massive. Yeah. And uh, just yesterday I was uh, scrolling through my LinkedIn feed and I saw the latest meme on this. Uh, so there's a shepherd and a massive flock of sheep following the shepherd. And the title says, uh, CMOs are going to yet another AI conference, <laughs> just, uh, you know, which is probably true. So uh, in the report, AI is called frenemy. When it just arrived, I remember the sentiment of all of us having these concerns that uh, it's going to be a massive takeover of creative professions. So, you know, our, I don't know, creative strategists, illustrators, uh, graphic designers, just designers will be uh, replaced by AI inevitably. But then it kind of evolved into this mantra that we are safe as long as we uh, can operate the creative power of AI and mm. it's just a tool in our hands. So what's our standpoint at the moment? I think... Certainly what we saw in the report is clients are really excited about the potential for efficiency with AI, but they don't believe it will ever replace human creativity. They don't believe it can possibly create content that really moves us, that touches our hearts, makes us laugh and cry. So I think it means that creativity and humanity will become more important than ever. And actually, I think it's a really interesting challenge. We always talk about what can be automated and what could be automated, what could be made more efficient. Actually, what everyone's going to get there with automation. It's quite interesting to think about what can't be automated and what can't be automated being the most valuable thing in a business. And that is heart and it's humanity. So that I think really turns on its head how you think about business. And I think when we think about jobs and, and job securities, I think two things I take some comfort from. What One is that We've had, you know, big industrial revolutions, you know, over the centuries and it, they've always created different jobs. So some jobs disappear, but other jobs spring up that are generally interesting and, and create great opportunity for people. And I think the other thing to your kind of point about Gen AI is this great new thing and everyone's kind of following like sheep. Typically, technologies have a really similar Sort of adoption curve and, and you have a huge hype cycle and people get incredibly excited and it's the future and it will transform everything and then reality kicks in and I think we'll probably see some of that that we start to think AI will change everything very quickly and then as we start to adopt it for the enterprise make sure it actually works in a very practical way for people the actual adoption curve will be much slower in terms of it having that really transformational effect so I think we've got some time to adapt still. So we're probably at the very highest point of this uh, adoption curve. Right. So then the trial of disillusionment, that's the, that's yeah, the exactly. next phase, right? Exactly. Exactly. You just have to look at, you know, what happened with cryptocurrency over the last 18 months. That was a, an exactly. incredibly fast peak of, you know, excitement and then came crashing down. And I'm sure we'll kind of course correct at some point. It was such an amazing way to put it. Uh, you can't automate heart. So speaking yeah. about the things you can't really automate, 81% of respondents agree that customers uh, will be prepared and will be ready to pay extra for human created content. Let's talk about this for a second. What exactly will be this human touch in terms of content generation in foreseeable future? I love that stat because it, it suggests that just as in the real world where we pay more for something that's handmade, you know, if you go into a bakery, it's a handmade loaf, or you go into an art gallery, it's a kind of handmade pot or whatever it is. The idea that in the online space, we'll start paying more for human crafted artifacts, I think is, is just so interesting. Um, I think journalism is a really nice case study here for our industry. So for quite a while now, newspapers like the New York Times and others have been using AI to write very fact-based content. So things like football match reports for college football or obituaries, things that are, are very factual, they do use an AI to generate. Um, but what really brings readers across and, and really generates attention is, is opinion. Um, and it's those writers who've got a really distinct point of view on the world. So I think it might turn to be quite similar for agencies that it is our opinion and our point of view on the world that is irreplaceable, um, which is is really interesting. Um, 
And the other example I think is, is super interesting is um, there's a, a brilliant singer um, called uh, Holly Herndon, I think it is. And she's created a digital twin um, of her own voice. So anyone can now take her voice and they can sing with it and they can create with it, which I, I just think is absolutely fascinating. So it's a brilliant example of, on the one hand, you're giving up control of, of your creative asset. On the other hand, you're taking control of it really, really well because you're licensing it and you still own the rights to that voice. So I think it's um, it'll be in that really interesting space of we create things, we own the kind of the original, we own the original point of view, and then that gets used and distributed in interesting ways. I wonder whether this applies to uh, different age groups. Let's shift to talking about the consumers, Gen Z, Gen Y, Gen Alpha, my favorite topic, because I feel really left out when people are talking about Gen Z. I always go like, okay, you know what? Gen Y has even more questions about life than Gen Z. So we haven't figured that out. So um, in terms of adopting this creative approach and in terms of approaching the new technologies and the new tools that are uh, appearing on the market. Do you think there's a massive difference between Gen Z, Gen Y, Gen Alpha now? And do you think that this differentiation based just on the age groups really work? I think like lots of people, you know, I, I'm skeptical that age is, is the only way to segment people. So it, it's very easy and very neat to say, well, Gen Z are like this and millennials are like that and Alpha are like this and wire like that and it, it's one thing that defines those people and you know there are so many other things their their values their their family background you know where they grow up you know a, a young person in a city is probably more similar to an older person in a city than, than someone in a, a kind of more rural environment so it's 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 far too neat of course people don't fall into those neat buckets whatever the memes might say um but i think there are quite structural differences as, as we evolve in terms of how different age groups engage with media, with technology, with content that brands are starting to wake up and pay attention to. And I think, I mean, again, there's always a hype cycle. So I think, you know, for, for years, the industry has been saying, oh, well, the age of interruption is over. You can't interrupt anymore. You've got to engage. But I think it's finally really it's statistically and, and scalably true that you can't reach those new generations with the tools that you used to engage in you know, their parents because they're not watching linear TV in the same ways. They are spending hours gaming. They're spending lots of time streaming. You know, they're much less likely to see their friends at the mall or at a concert. They're much more likely to see them in Fortnite or, or Roblox or whatever it might be. Why is Gen Z is a demographic that's causing that particular concern for uh, people in marketing departments? Why is it so hard for us to connect to that particular audience and it causes all the struggles with reaching and engaging with this generation? Yeah, I, I think it's because as an industry, we have got, we're really, really good at interrupting people. You know, it's what we've done. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> what we do. And it's and it's very, very scalable. So if you think about a global brand, you can say, well, here's your 30 second spot, here's your 60 second spot, here are your kind of different assets. Now take those and, and, and use those around the world. And the more bespoke approaches um that are probably more effective in engaging Gen Z, be that influencer partnerships or content creation, music platforms, gaming historically they've been a little bit harder to scale around the world but when we look now at the gaming platforms when we look at platforms like netflix hbo they have got that global reach so i think it's becoming um easier to globalize those less traditional approaches so i think that will really help um and i think it's just that kind of mindset shift of you know gen z are not this kind of niche group who are kind of doing interesting things on the sidelines. They're coming of age very quickly and their spending power is increasing very quickly. Um, and, you know, they are now a really significant part of our consumer base. So that the, the overall consumer base is, is just changing as those people come of age and we've got to take it seriously. And if we don't connect with them in the spaces and places that they are, we're going to 
be ignored and were going to be ineffective. The report also mentions that 77% of uh, the marketers you spoke with agree that consumer behavior as a whole changed so rapidly in the last five years that the agencies are sort of struggling to keep up. Why do you think that is? And what do we have, like what tricks do we have up our sleeve to uh, work with that? Yeah, I think so much ha has changed about consumer behavior. Um, and I think it's really important to, to call out that it is behavior. It's not necessarily fundamental attitudes or beliefs or, or, or things like that. But it, in t the, the way that people use platforms has changed so quickly. Part of that has been accelerated by the pandemic. Um, but there's also some incredible data I, I saw the other day, which showed that from about the year 2000, all kinds of behaviors changed and people became less likely to go to a concert, less likely to get a driving license. Lots and lots of things changed with this kind of extraordinary kind of shift, which was mass adoption of the internet. And I don't know if we've ever seen anything quite like it in terms of how it changed all these other kind of behaviors that go around it. So, um, you know, it, it is always hard to keep up with, with changes that happen that quickly. But again, it's, you know, it is a change to our business model. Our business model has been so strongly about interruption. And, you know, it's easy to look at other industries and go, oh, well, why don't you pivot? You've got to kind of change faster. Um, for us to kind of fundamentally change our business model from interruption to engagement, to experiences away from kind of one to many towards those kind of one to one interactions. It, it is a big change for agencies and, and for the industry. And I think we are all pivoting quickly, but um, there's no question that um, our consumers are, are racing ahead. Exactly. And with this idea of we need to reach our audience and we need to be precise and we need a precise tool set for that. I feel like it's a, an eternal question of whether we're using performance marketing to be, you know, on the precision side of things, or we are recommitting to brand. And I find it quite fascinating that 77% of CMOs agree that there's a need to double down on performance. However, 75 agree uh, to this thing, recommitting to brand. Um, it's been my personal struggle for years as well. And just because of my background, I always sort of opted for brand building because I feel like without a proper brand storytelling and brand narrative, brand mythology, you can't really do performance properly because people would not just connect to whatever you show them. But uh, what's your take on this? And do you actually think that there's a drama between performance and brand building? And uh, what's, what's your take on this? I love that data point because it was it was so funny to see that it was almost identical. <laughs> yeah. Saying no, we've got to double down on brand, and no, we've got to double down on performance. And there's there's some local nuance in the data that helps sort of explain some of that. So some markets are much more oriented towards brand, some are much more oriented towards performance. But but still, overall, people are in really similar places. Um, how I interpret it is. Clients want us to do both those things brilliantly. They're sort of fed up with the debate almost. Um, they want us to be brilliant at building brand desire and brilliant at capitalizing and, and really driving demand um, and almost avoiding things that fall into the middle ground in between. So, you know, sometimes you try and cram it all into one piece of communication and you do neither of those things very well. So I think probably what clients are saying is be brilliant at both ends of that spectrum. Don't try and mix it up. But also, I think there's an opportunity for us to experiment with new formats and new ideas that really do away with that distinction, that really bring those moments of inspiration and moments of transaction much closer together, you know, and really blur those boundaries between what's a brilliantly engaging piece of content and what's a really hard work in commerce activity. Can you recall any of the latest exciting uh, client campaigns on both ends that, that we did recently? So I think something that really brings those together brilliantly is um, the latest work for KFC um, from our team in China, the KFC Restore. Um, so I mean, the, the team in China have been working you know, for a really long period with KFC to transform its relationship with younger audiences. And the Restore is the latest example. It's a, a virtual KFC store. 
that's built in one of China's biggest social platforms for young people. Um, it's a brilliantly, beautifully crafted, immersive experience. Young people can go there. They can hang out with friends. They can create their own virtual KFC store. They can chat with Colonel Sanders. Um, and it's, it's beautifully crafted. The engagement is, is huge. The numbers on it are extraordinary. There are sort of hundreds of millions of virtual items being sold. But it also connects with real world ordering. So if you place an order in the virtual world, it will arrive at your door and you can track that delivery. And it's just a brilliant coming together of, of, of entertainment and gaming and engagement and commerce. Like literally all of it. Yeah. That's really yeah. mind blowing. Yeah. Um, my last question would be quite philosophical. So whatever we do, AI based, virtual reality based, uh, you know, whichever tools we are using, we are fighting for people's attention. And the term appeared in the 70s. And ever since we have this understanding that attention is scarce, we have 24 hours of people's active brain waves. And I mean, out of those, you take eight where people are sleeping, obviously. <laughs> so uh, how do you think brands can capture and maintain consumers' attention in today's world when well, first of all, the world is a mess and you, the world is increasingly competitive and its intentions scarce. So what are the maybe philosophical ideas that you have about this, not regarding the tools, but regarding the approach itself? Yeah, so I think what's interesting is I'm not sure people have got shorter attention spans at all. And there's been some great research and some great data done on this. I think people have got very polarized attention these days. So they can go deeper and deeper into the things they love. So they'll spend, you know, 12, 13, 14 hours with gaming. They will binge box sets. They'll stream, you know, every episode of a series all at once in 24 hours. So they've got incredible attention spans for the things they love, but they're much better able to filter out the things that they don't. So I think our challenge is how do we give our brands a really unfair share of attention. And if we can understand what our audiences love, um, we can understand the formats, the channels, the platforms that they really want to spend their time with, then we'll be giving brands that really unfair share of attention and, and will be much, much more effective. Um, so I think people have got attention for the things they love it, and they're just getting brilliant at filtering out the things that they don't. And often the things that they don't are advertising because i think coming back to the survey you know 58 of clients saying that we've forgotten how to entertain people um and i think that is one thing that people are crying out for at the moment is is moments of joy moments of uplift um the world is crazy as you say um and i think we're definitely seeing that in all that craziness if we can combine the right message in the right moment with the right contextual signal to just make people smile, give them moments of joy, moments of respite. I think that will be really, really effective for us. In the end, it's all about love, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think what we're seeing a lot of in the world at the moment is amidst all the craziness, um, people are turning to those moments of joy as almost a kind of act of sort of rebellion. That if brands can be there, it's a really powerful emotional place to play and generate that brand love, as you say. Thank you so much, Pat, for this conversation. And this has been the short story of the CMO report at Dentsu. <laughs> <laughs>